All right, so there are some consequences of this. Um, first of all, I, it's obvious that if uh, one of the reflection, for example, if RL is zero, you say it's reflectionless from the left. If RR is zero, you call it reflectionless from the right. If uh, TL is one, you say it, that the, the, the system is transparent from the left. If TR is one, you say it is transparent from right. If you have reflectionlessness and transparency from left, you call it invisible from left, and similarly for invisibility from the right. So I don't want to write these down, they are obvious. Um, before I continue, well, I want to make some comments. Last time I mentioned that if you find uh, some positive real uh, wave number for which M22 vanishes, then that corresponds to what we call the spectral singularity, and it's when you have purely outgoing waves. Uh, this equation is actually uh, more than that, because if you remove this condition and allow k to be complex, then you can essentially get the bound states and resonances also. So not only spectral singularities, but bound states and resonances are also zeros of this M22. So it's a generating function for very uh, many interesting things. Um, Well, if you perform a time reversal transformation, if you look at this formula, a sigma one, uh, see this matrix, if you multiply from the left, it swaps the rows. If you multiply it from the right, it swaps the columns, right? And so time translation essentially changes rows and columns and complex conjugates. So if uh, I write it in terms of its entries, what do I get is um, M22, M11, M21, M12, complex conjugates. So this is the um, transfer matrix for the time reversed system. And as you see, if I, so this is, and this is what I call M bar. So if I look at uh, M bar 2, 2, it is M 1, 1 star. So if you have a spectral singularity in your time reverse system, this will vanish, but that would mean M 1, 1 is zero in your original system. So this vanishes. Now, if I put that quantity zero, and remember the definition of the transfer matrix, you remember you had, we had this coefficients. Again, this must, my A and B, A plus B plus R, like that, A minus, B minus. They are the coefficients of the right going and left going waves. So if you, I have zero here, if I multiply this matrix, what do I get? I get M12 B minus, M21 A minus, plus M22 B minus, right? Now, if I put B minus equal to zero, what does that mean? Um, I don't have anything coming out, okay? Then, because B minus is zero, plus becomes zero. This would say A plus equal to zero. So this I eliminate together with that. 
doesn't mean that I must do it, but I can do it. That is. And there is one remaining constraint is that B plus should then be M21 A minus. In other words, I can get a solution, a scattering type solution of my equation which has purely incoming uh, boundary conditions, but I have to maintain this relation which connects the amplitude of the wave coming from the right to the amplitude of the incoming wave from the left. So this is what is called uh, Cohen per, uh, perfect absorption, CPA. In optical setup, this is just the time reversal of a laser. A laser emits lights, purely outgoing waves. And this is when you send light from both ends and the system absorbs. But this is, not, this is much more difficult to achieve because in a laser, you just put, you arrange the parameters of your system for M22 to be zero. And then it starts oscillating. But here, not only you have to make M110, which means you have to play with your parameters of your system, you also have to maintain uh, amplitude and phase relation for the incoming waves, which is much more difficult. So it's additional constraints. Okay. Now, so the same equations you can turn around and make the conditions for P symmetry. This means P symmetry, this means uh, time reversal symmetry, and this means PT symmetry. So this is. <clears throat> and from those equations, you use substitute here, and you get various relationships between reflection and transmission amplitudes. Um, so for p-symmetry, obviously, as I mentioned last time, uh, p-symmetry, I mean, the content of this equation is just the left and right uh, reflection and transmission amplitudes are the same. And that's all to it, obviously. Left and right are swapped and nothing happens. With T-symmetry, you get more interesting things. Again, you substitute this equation here balance both sides, and you get the following. R, left, right, complex conjugate, becomes minus D star R, right, left, and T, left, right, complex conjugate, becomes D star T, left, right. This left goes to right, here left goes to left comes out of the equations. <clears throat> and this has several, these two uh, relations have several consequences, I can call it the theorem. Uh, first of all, if I take absolute value of both sides of this, this and this are equal, so the absolute value of D should be one. That's the first consequence. Remember D is, this quantity, which happens to be the determinant of this matrix. So, one. So, the determinant of this matrix is a phase. It can vanish, for example, it can blow up. And then, two, uh, using this relation, again, by taking absolute values and using this thing, you can prove 
the following. So reflection and transmission amplitudes do not need to be the same, but their absolute value are the same. So therefore, reflection and transmission coefficients are the same, and they are given by this formula where you can have plus or minus and three if uh, you have uh, reciprocal transmission for some wave number. So this T left and T right, if they are equal, then you have to take the minus sign here. And then you can write this as this is sometimes called unitarity, right? But here, I don't make any assumption about unitary time evolution or anything. This is time reversal symmetry. So time reversal symmetry together with reciprocal transmission gives you unitarity. So, this equation says you can't have unidirectional reflection, right? You can't have the zero and this not zero. This relation says you can't have respective singularities. Why? At the respective singularity, this blows up. Well, this says it's a bounded function. So, if you have reciprocity in transmission for all wave numbers, then you don't have uh, singularities. Uh, because I assume T symmetry, if you don't have spectral singularities, you can't have a CPA either. So these nice, interesting things won't happen. For a standard uh, potential scattering, uh, time reversal symmetry means uh, that uh, your potential is real. That's standard quantum mechanics. None of these will happen. What about PT symmetry? So again, you go back, uh, take this equation, substitute here. And that leads to the following relations. <clears throat> and again, using these, you can show Again, take absolute value modulus of both sides of this, you get the absolute value is one. Uh, two. Um, if you come here and take the determinant, you also see the determinant of M is one. So for PT symmetric systems, not only determinant of the S matrix is one, but determinant of the M is also one. So an absolute value on this. And then there is this analog of this relation, which takes this form. TLTR is either this case one or one plus or minus case two. So either that or this is true. Again, um, these come from those equations or those of you and the proofs are given in my this book chapter, which I mentioned last time. I don't have to. I mean, this 
needs more time and they are very easy arguments, so I don't want to waste time on that. Now, uh, furthermore, if this holds, um, that is, you have reciprocity in transmission, implies two. So the case two applies if you have reciprocity in transmission. I emphasize this case because you will see that uh, potential scattering, you have reciprocity theorem, and this will hold. But if you have like non-local uh, potential or you have point, uh, point interactions, then it m might not hold. <clears throat> now, unlike time reversal symmetry, uh, these equations don't uh, uh, forbid unidirectional reflection because RL star goes to RL. So if one of them is zero, the other one doesn't need to be zero. So you can have unidirectional reflection for PT symmetric systems. Also, uh, you can have spectral singularities because you can have a minus sign there. You can have this blowing up and this blowing up, uh, sorry, with a plus sign. So PT symmetric systems allow both spectral singularities and therefore a time reversal, CPA, and also unidirectional reflection. In fact, you see what happens if, um, if you have RL0 and if you go to its PT transform system because of the, well, I didn't write, I wrote it last time, the transformation property, after you do this, this is still zero. In other words, PT preserves the equation for, uh, and also the, the, this one. So under PD, the equations which define what is unidirectional invisibility uh, are invariant. In other words, if you have a PT symmetric system, the system has the same symmetry as these equations. And that leads to the fact that when you have a PT symmetric system and you want to find its unidirection invisible configurations, it's much easier. In, in simple problems, if you don't have PT symmetry and you can get non-PT symmetric unidirection invisible configurations, for example, for bilayer, but it's much more difficult to do it because the equations don't have, I mean, have uh, symmetries which the, the system doesn't. Okay. Next, I will confine. So all that I said so far uh, are valid for all sorts of linear scattering problems. Now I will start talking about potential scattering. That means we are back to Schrodinger equation, but the potential can be complex. And I demand that it dies out fast enough so that I have plain asymptotics. Uh, sufficient condition is the Fadeev condition, but for all practical purposes, you can think of finite range potentials. <clears throat> um, but there are several theorems which are kind of underline what scattering, potential scattering. One of them is that if the five conditions holds, again I remind you, if this is finite, the theorem says the Yost solutions exist and are 
continuous functions of a wave number in upper half plane. You make k into a complex variable, you have the complex plane. Upper half plane, they are continuous functions. And as I mentioned last time, this implies that you can't have zero transmission amplitude, either from left or right. Uh, the proof is uh, difficult. For example, uh, given by, in this paper by Kemp, it's a mathematical proof, Canadian Journal of Mathematics. Another theorem which is very relevant is if uh, you have a potential which decays exponentially as goes to plus or minus infinity, uh, what does that mean, i.e., there is some positive real number such that e to the uh, mu x dx is finite as x goes to uh, Then the Yost solutions are uh, holomorphic or complex analytic functions in a in the strip. If this is the complex K plane, this is the real axis, this is the imaginary axis, there is a strip like this, inside which Yost solutions are complex analytic. So remember Yost solutions, there are two of them, one of them goes like this, then X goes to plus infinity, and here you have some formulas, I don't want to write it. And the other one, um, it comes to minus ikx, when x goes to minus infinity and some expression for the other side. Now, obviously, they will depend on k, because they are solutions of the Schrodinger equation, which involves a k. So they are functions not only of x, but also of k. And their dependence on k has this analytic analyticity uh, properties. Uh, again, for a proof of this thing, uh, there's this paper of 1968 by Blaschuk. Uh, it took me months to dig this out. <laughs> it's uh, published in Ukraine. Uh, it's translated into English. It's a very nice paper. It's, it's on inverse scattering for complex potentials. It's very, I mean, no, even people in inverse scattering, most of them don't know this because they try to develop complex inverse scattering methods, uh, whereas this paper does it all. <laughs> so, obviously, this applies for exponential decaying functions, it will definitely apply when you have finite support, compact support, because if your potential vanishes outside a, um, outside a finite interval, you can take this mu anything you like to satisfy that condition, and that says if you have finite support, finite range implies uh, that 
These Yoast solutions are complex analytic everywhere in the complex plane. They are entire functions. Now, if you go back to the formula uh, for the, um, well, I, I think, I guess I need, to write down the, the things which I didn't. <laughs> so, uh, yesterday I gave you formulas in terms of T's and R's. But you can also uh, write them in terms of um, uh, let, let me come back because there will be one simplification I have to first establish and then I write those formulas. <clears throat> The next important result, uh, I need some space, is reciprocity theorem. The reciprocity theorem simply says, in potential scattering, the left and right transmission amplitudes are the same. It's a, not so intuitively well understood result, but it's very easy to prove it. <coughs> so, and the proof uses this formulas that I needed there, so I write it here. So this is in terms of the components of the transfer matrix. These are the Yost solutions, asymptotics of the Yost solutions. Now, the proof is actually very, very easy. You just calculate the Veronskian. So, I define W to be the Veronskian of these two solutions. These are solutions of a second order equation, and the Veronskian is psi plus psi minus prime minus psi minus psi plus prime. If you take its derivative, uh, so I get derivative of this and that they cancel, and then you get psi second derivative over these, which you can simplify using your differential equation, and you find that the result is zero. So Veronskian for a second order equation without the first order derivative is zero, which means the Veronskian is constant. Therefore, you can evaluate this quantity, which is a function of x, anywhere you like, you should get the same number. So what do you do? You evaluate at plus or minus infinity. Uh, to be precise, you evaluate at a and b, and take a to minus infinity, b at plus infinity. <coughs> and um, let's see how much. 
Well, I better not do the calculations. Just you, you take these formulas, for example, at minus infinity, you have this formula for psi plus. You take its derivative, you get psi plus prime. And for psi minus, this is the value at minus infinity. You take its derivative, that's the derivative, and you substitute. And you get the value of this at minus infinity. So what happens if you do that, this thing uh, comes out to be minus 2i m22 over determinant of m. And as you see, it's a constant. Then you take the substitute, everything have x's, but they cancel out and you can take the limit and that's a constant. And this happens to be this. Now, if you calculate the same thing at plus infinity, that is, you use this formula for psi plus, this formula for psi minus, and you calculate the same thing, what you find is minus 2i m22. There is a missing k. Minus 2i k m22 over the determinant is minus 2i k m22. Because they must be the same, it's constant, doesn't depend on x. So this says determinant of m is 1. But last time I showed you that the determinant of m is just the ratio of the transmission amplitudes. So that completes the proof. So that says transmission is the same. And I will, from now on, use no superindex. T means transmission amplitude. Uh, this proof doesn't use uh, any assumption on reality of the potential. It applies to both real and complex potentials. <coughs> Some books claim that holds only for real. Even prominent mathematics books I have seen could do that. Now, <coughs> well, unfortunately, I erased it. So when TL is equal to TR, remember, it has some consequences for uh, time reversal invariant systems and for T-symmetric systems, which in this case means uh, V is real valued. potential. Uh, that says I mean, these are derived, but remember there was a statement about the case that it was reciprocal transmission, and this is the unitary. So in this case, it corresponds to the unitarity in quantum mechanics. But this holds also for non-unitary time reversal invariant systems. <clears throat> for PT symmetry, you find this relation, which was uh, obtained by Lee and Stone and others. Now, another important consequence of this reciprocity is that I can go back to my uh, formula and erase this determinant of it because it is one. Now, why is this important? Because now you see the Yost solutions depend on the entries of M in a linear way. Okay? Now, this theorem says Yost solutions are analytic in that strip. So that implies that these entries of M must be analytic in that strip. 
And for finite range potentials, they are entire functions. Now, one of the most important properties of entire functions or analytic functions is that their zeros are isolated points, right? Uh, either they are equal to zero, and if they are not, if they have zeros, they must be isolated. You can't have them vanishing in an interval. So that says this, uh, so for example, if we look at this, M21 is RL over TR. So if you want RL to be zero, you want M21 to be zero, but that can't be zero over an interval. That says you can't have broadband reflectionlessness. The same applies for the right reflectionlessness and also transparency, because transparency means M22 is one. Well, M22 is entire function. M22 minus one is an entire function. So that can't vanish over an interval. So all these properties of reflectionlessness, invisibility, and transparencies, they can have in, happen in discrete positions, isolated positions over the real axis. Or they can happen all over the real axis, and there are examples of uh, those, like Hochstetler potential, which has no reflection for any uh, wave number. Uh, similarly, with respect to spectral singularities. So spectral singularity is when M22 vanishes, well, zeros of M22. So they are isolated. M11 equal to zero, CPA, they, they are all isolated. You can't have any of these properties happening for an exponentially decaying potential uh, on an interval. Well, if you remove this, you allow that potential vanishes not exponentially but slower, then you can have it. But these are not physically very easy to implement. <clears throat> okay. So, this essentially completes the general uh, discussion of scattering theory. And the, the rem remainder of these lectures are about uh, what I call the dynamical formulation of scattering theory. So what is the motivation? Yesterday I talked about the composition property of transfer matrices in the general case. For the potential scattering, it reduces to the following. You have a potential, real or complex valued. You write it as sum of two potentials whose support do not intersect. And I choose the support of V1 to be to the left of the support of uh, V2. So maybe your potential has something. Uh, oh, I want to plot its absolute value because it's complex valued. And you make a choice of some point A and you dissect your potential into two pieces. One of them is this, and the other one is the rest. So it vanishes, this is V1, which vanishes for A, X larger than uh, A, and this is V2, which vanishes for that. So um, if I1 and I2 are supports 
of V1 and V2. I1 is to the left of I2. I write it like this. So I1 less than I2 means I1 is to the left of I2. And if I find the transfer matrices for these, and I call them M, M1, and M2, I showed you that the transfer matrix of the sum is the product of uh, the pieces, and the ordering has to do with this ordering. Oops. <clears throat> Uh, this formula for the transfer matrix uh, 2013 reminded me of the way you compose evolution operators in quantum mechanics. So if you have a Hamiltonian in some Hilbert space and it can be time dependent, you can find its uh, time evolution operator, which is some uh, time-ordered exponential. Uh, this essentially means that it satisfies the Schrodinger equation, and I will always take h bar to be 1. Um, now, suppose this is the t-axis, the time axis, and you start from uh, time t0, you evolve to time t1, and then time t2. Well, this is done by t1, t0, and this is done by t2, t1, right? And then you can also evolve directly, which is done by t2, t0. So if you call this u1, call this u2, they are some unitary operators, and call this u, then you have that u1 is u2, u1, right? And it looks very much like this. So I asked the question that, can I find, uh, some Hamiltonian which will give the transfer matrix of a scattering theory as its evolution operator. But this is a kind of misleading. You would say that, well, for put the potential defines your Hamiltonian. <laughs> it's p squared uh, plus v. But that is not what I mean. You give me the scattering potential, it has a transfer matrix, and I want to write this transfer matrix in terms of some uh, evolution operator, which comes from some Hamiltonian. Okay? First of all, this is a two by two matrix. So well, that must be two by two matrix, and therefore this must be two by two matrix if it exists at all. Okay, so it's just two level system in a way. But how do you find that? Uh, you might say, who cares? <laughs> Why do you want to find that? Well, this is like uh, a game. You play it, and after a while, you see that it has advantages. And I'll show a lot of advantages of this question. So. Turns out that um, there is actually such a Hamiltonian, such a matrix, two by two matrix Hamiltonian. And I use matrices bold face. <clears throat> so how do I find it? I just carry through a very simple calculation, which leads to it. So what do we know? First of all, we know that the wave equation is. Yes. <clears throat> uh, 
The second thing we know is that this is scattering potential, so I have asymptotic plane waves. In other words, psi x goes like linear combination of two plane waves asymptotically. Uh, the first step is uh, find or construct. I do know that these are two by two, so the Hilbert space that I have, this is essentially C2, right? Uh, so the wave functions are two component wave functions. Um, and I want to construct a two component wave function. I use a uh, capital letter, which has this asymptotics. It goes to A plus minus, B plus minus, as X goes to plus minus infinity. <coughs> You'll see in a minute why I need that. Well, how do I get it? Well, I make an ansatz for it. I just take, uh, you see, I'm the Schrodinger equation uh, satisfied by u is first order, right? And this is second order. Somehow I have to go from second order to first order. So that's essentially going to two components, writing a second order equation as a system of first order equations. So its components should involve derivatives of this psi. So what I do, just take a linear combination of psi and psi prime with some coefficients alpha, beta, uh, gamma, delta which are unknown, and then just uh, impose that condition. Now, I know that psi has this asymptotics, right? I can take its derivative. This is ik a plus minus a to the ik minus b plus minus e to the minus ik x plus minus infinity. So I use these formulas, substitute here, multiply, and then take the, and already the limit, equated to this. So, uh, for this asymptotic values of x, psi and psi prime are given to me, and then I can compute this and put equal to that one. That precisely gives you four equations, four linear equations for the four unknowns, alpha, beta, gamma, and delta. So it's unique. I plan to do the calculation on board, but I think I don't have time. So I will, it takes half a page. So that gives you this. This will do it. It satisfies this asymptotic condition. Now, where do I get the Hamiltonian? Well, I want this to solve the Schrodinger equation, time-dependent Schrodinger equation, for some two by two Hamiltonian. So I demand that this thing be equal to some x-dependent two by two matrix Hamiltonian times Psi. And again, what you should do, you have to just take derivative of this with respect to X, and things simplify a lot, and then write a two by two matrix here, H11, H12, H13, 
H21H22, and just force the equation. And again, you'll get four equations for the un four unknowns which appear in this H. So this matrix Hamiltonian H is also uniquely determined. And it has amazingly simple form. Actually, let me give you the one middle step. If you calculate uh, this thing, you get D over 2K minus IK plus minus IKX times theta psi. So what, where does this potential come in? Uh, when you take the derivative of psi, you will get the second derivative of psi. And then you use your differential equation to write in terms of v. So that's how v enters into the game. And then you write this thing in this form, and you find these h's. So from this two equations, you find your Hamiltonian. Again, I plan to do all this on board, but I don't think I have time. So, the end result of this calculation is the following. And that's it. Potential comes as a coefficient, and this part of the matrix is universal. For all potentials, it has the same form. Now, one thing you can see that this Hamiltonian is not Hermitian. Even if your potential is real, which doesn't need to, this is never Hermitian. In fact, you can write this this way. Oops. Sigma 3 is the Pauli matrix, and this K this matrix, which is nilpotent. It's not even diagonalizable. So this Hamiltonian is not even diagonalizable. This is the worst type of Hamiltonian you can imagine, and it governs the scattering theory. <laughs> so people who are against non-Hermitian Hamiltonians, I always show this. Now, you can also show that if you take the adjoint, you get Vx star over Vx sigma 3 h sigma 3, and I could put minus 1. So if you have a real potential, it is pseudo Hermitian. It obviously not positive definite sigma 3, because this is not even diagonalizable. There are no positive metric, but for complex potentials, it's not so the Hermitian, but you see it commutes with its adjoint. So if you um, define the adjoint, what I call pseudo adjoint, by sigma 3 adjoint sigma 3, then you can easily see that the pseudo adjoint and H commutes so it's pseudo-normal. So it's this Hamilton is pseudo-normal. For complex case, for real potentials, it's pseudo-emission. Oh, yeah, there is an example. Yeah. Yeah. 
it should produce these, right? <laughs> Thank you. OK, so what? I mean, I got Hamiltonian, and uh, what I wanted was to get this relationship, right? And that is now an immediate consequence of this calculation. So I have these uh, two component wave function, which by construction satisfies the Schrodinger equation. But notice that this is not time. It is the space which plays the role of time. But so what? I mean, it's a real variable. I can take it to be an evolution parameter. So if this satisfies the Schrodinger equation for H, then I should be able to write this in terms of the time evolution operator for that Hamiltonian, right? And now, take x2 plus infinity, x0 to minus infinity. When x goes to plus infinity, this is a plus b plus, right? That is where I started with. x goes to plus infinity, so this is plus infinity. x0 goes to minus infinity, minus infinity. And psi of minus infinity is a minus b minus. So this is nothing but the transfer matrix. By definition, it was the matrix which connected this to that. And transfer matrix is unique for the linear case. And you have this relationship. Now, this formula you have encountered, and <laughs> it is called the S matrix in interaction picture, right? But in this case, it is the transfer matrix of the potential. So this offers a new way of looking at transfer matrices. Also, it describes why transfer matrix satisfies its composition property, because it's related to <laughs> Evolution operators, and they do satisfy that. Uh, but this goes beyond the, oh, the nice feeling that one gets when connects to different things. It is useful. Um, and still, M is fixed, so why do I call it dynamical? Now I want to make it dynamical that I want to derive a dynamical equation for M, but that's very simple if you do the following. So consider how much time do I have? Oh. So I take my potential, I define a family of potentials parameterized by this y, which is a real variable, this is the same as Vx if x is less than y. It is 0 if x is bigger than y. Maybe I can call it there. It doesn't matter. So essentially, for each y, I truncate my potential at that position. So. Um, This is V, and this is Y. The truncated potential is this thing. <coughs> OK. So um, then potential vanishes. If you look at the Hamiltonian. The Hamiltonian also vanishes. If you have zero Hamiltonian, the evolution will be just identity, right? So if I compute the time, so for this Vy, I can get the corresponding two component Hamiltonian, and I can get its time evolution operator. Uh, and my point is that. Um, so this will be 0 if 
x is bigger than y. And it will be just h if x is less than or equal to y. Now, what is this thing? So this is the going to be the transfer matrix for this potential which is parameterized with y. So I'm repeating everything for this by. It's a scattering uh, potential, and it has a transfer matrix, which I call y. And by this argument, I can repeat and write the time evolution operator for this uh, Hamiltonian. But you see, the Hamiltonian vanishes for values of x which are bigger than y. Okay. So because of that, this I can write as this thing. which is the same as this thing. You see? Okay, so evolve from here to here is exactly like the old potential, but afterwards there is no evolution. So the ident it's identity, so you get this thing. Now, I realize that this satisfies the Schrodinger equation, right? So I do have a I take the y derivative of this thing, it is the Hamiltonian times uh, oops, y minus infinity. So I, because this is just the transfer matrix, maybe I make it uh, as an argument. So I get a differential equation for the transfer matrix of the truncated potential. Now, what is the initial condition? Well, initial condition is, uh, if I put this equal to minus infinity, minus infinity minus infinity is one, right? So this is identity matrix. So this is the initial value problem which you should solve to get the transfer matrix for the truncated potential. But if I take y to plus infinity, I get my transfer matrix of the initial potential. So this is a dynamical equation which you should solve to get the transfer matrix. Obviously, if you're potential has finite range, this minus infinity goes to A, plus infinity goes to B. So you need to solve this dynamical equation just in an interval, A, B. And this is the case for finite range potentials. So you can treat scattering theory with solving this. <coughs> now, uh, even at this stage, I can write this as a time-ordered exponential formally. So that is this thing, right? Which is really a shorthand notation for this Dyson series, right? So this is minus i. plus minus i squared. Okay? Now, why do I want to emphasize this? Because, you look at the potential, uh, your Hamiltonian, the potential appear here. So the first term in the expansion of your transfer matrix, this involves one copy of V, this involves two copies of P, and so on. So this is very nice for perturbation theory. If you have a weak potential, you just truncate the series. Nth order perturbation theory means truncating this series after n plus one terms. Now, 
these have this very simple form. <laughs> so those integrals can be done very easily. What happens is actually, I don't have time, but please, I mean, doing this integral, just writing it out, it takes like three lines. And once you multiply this v and take the integral, you see that the effect of these become just taking the Fourier transform of v. So all the terms in the series becomes various Fourier transforms of your potential, and which you can easily compute and get nth order perturbation of your transfer matrix. But once you have your transfer matrix, its entries are reflection and transmission coefficients. So you get a very, very fast way of doing perturbation theory in scattering. Second order perturbation theory formulas for reflection and transmission coefficients using this method takes half a page. <laughs> I mean, do it with other things that you know. It's much longer. These are all in my papers, 2014. <clears throat> I can give you references later. Um, so I um, wonder whether you can make a comment about your approach and the lipman schringer approach for solving the scattering potential, right? Because they, are, they have a very similar um, structure. And then once you use a bone approximation, you also have this perturbation series. Looks like it's also, um, in that approach, it's also a um, Fourier transform of your potential. So I wonder whether you have a look at that. Yeah. First bone approximation is exactly the first term here, OK? But in lipman schwinger you need to calculate Green's functions, right? Oh, it, yeah, yeah. 1D is very simple, right? Yeah. So if you want to do first born an approximation, this is not easier or harder than the other one. But do the second and third order approximation. Then this is much faster. <clears throat> OK, so I have 15 minutes, oh, 13. <laughs> so I skipped some of the things that I wanted to say. <clears throat> so going back to the main theme, dynamical formulation. So I have a differential equation for m, right? Uh, M, its entries involve R's and T. T, L, T, R are the same. So there are three functions inside M, which are nonlinear, I mean, dependent on M. If you take that formula for M in terms of R's and T and plug in that differential equation, you get precisely three horrible nonlinear equation for reflection and transmission coefficients of the truncated potential. So I have this potential. For that, I will get left reflection, right reflection, and transmission. Everything will depend on y. And I'll get differential equations for these. It took me a while, uh, about 20 pages of calculations, to reduce these three equations to a single linear equation. Uh, and I will just write uh, them down so I can find them. The thing is actually more complicated than that because first you need to do a change of variable. So I introduce a new variable. It's a complex variable. It runs on unit circle. So it defines you a contour. It's an arc of a circle of the unit circle in complex plane. And I take now a finite range potential support is A and B. So
this is the complex plane. It's a unit circle. And this is not whole of it. It starts somewhere. Actually, it starts from here. It's like this. It's a minus, so it goes clockwise rather than counterclockwise. So this is e to the minus um, 2ika, which I will call za. And this is the endpoint zb, which is e to the 2i kb. Obviously, this length of this curve may be bigger than 2 pi, but bigger than pi, and it can run around it. OK? And it, in particular, it can close. And you can traverse the circle any number of times, which are actually the interesting things. With this change of variable, you go from x or y, doesn't matter, to this z variable. And those differential equations reduce to the following expressions. Um, This is a contour integral about this contour, C. This is a function S. It's derivatives. Our right is and T. 1 over S prime of ZB. This is actually the solution of the initial value problem. That is, these are the reflection and transmission coefficient for your initial potential. So I have solved the equation and evaluated at the end point with the proper initial conditions. So what is, you see, there is this S function, and this S function uh, satisfies this equation. It's a linear second order equation and the initial conditions on and this little z you solve it on this contour. So you have to solve that equation on this contour. These are the this is the initial point, that's the end point. And this v hat is actually the potential written in terms of uh, new variables. So uh, to be precise, this is i ln z over 2k, so that uh, v hat of each to minus 2 i k x is v x. So if you know v, you essentially get v tilde. You put it there, you try to solve it. And this is a differential equation on <coughs> um, the thing, on this contour. Now, you might say, well, I mean, we already had a Schrodinger equation, which was much easier. <laughs> it was in an interval. Now I'm in a circle and complicated. The point is that with the Schrodinger equation, you don't have this kind of nice direct formulas which gives you, for example, transmission coefficient in terms of the solution directly, right? Now, this scheme is actually not better than solving differential equation, but it's better if you want to do inverse problems. Suppose you want to find a unidirectionally right invisible potential at some k value. And by the way, k is fixed, so for each k, you have to solve this equation because k is here and also here. <clears throat> and for that k, you get the values of reflection and transmission. So for example, suppose you want to so find a unidirectionally invisible potential at some k. Hmm? It's easy. The unidirection invisible means that this should be 1. So S prime of Zb must be 1. This should be zero, because if it's right invisible, this, should, this is zero. So you get a relationship between 
S prime and S, so you get S of ZB equal to something. So this is one, so you get S of ZB is equal to ZB, okay? But the only thing you need is to find a function to put here, take derivative, that that function only has to satisfy these two conditions and these two conditions. And there are infinitely many ways you can find. Take polynomials. And this is actually the, the first example where you have unidirectional invisibility exactly without no approximations. The initial example which was found is e to the 2ik exponential. It's not exactly unidirectionally invisible. It's approximately. It's actually first born approximation exact. Uh, I mean, invisible. Second born approximation, it becomes trans not transparent. <coughs> I'll give you one example. Again, I plan to do all this with calculations on board, but there is no time. So take, for simplicity, just the interval to be from 0 to L. And this L I take to be a multiple of my uh, wave number. Uh, that, so, sorry i times n when n is some positive integer, and take s to be z alpha z minus square plus 1. Now this will satisfy all those four properties. I mean, this equation, this equation, and these two equations. But I have taken a equal to zero, so this becomes one, and this becomes one, and this becomes one. And zb is also one because uh, now my contour is closed. So these are also one. You can check that it works, and this alpha is a free parameter. For each alpha, I have an S which satisfies this numerical coefficients. So I take this S, which obviously is a polynomial, it has cubic polynomial, you put it in differential equation, you don't solve the differential equation, you just take second derivative and read up what V is, and V from V hat, you get your potential. The potential turns out to be this. First of all, outside the interval, it is zero, and inside it has this form. Let me call k, k zero the, the k which I have chosen, because you have to choose one particular value of the wave number in which you have this invisibility, and the denominator Now, the way I have arranged, actually, this contour now starts from here and goes around the circle n times. So this n is also a free variable. So I have two free variables. By construction, the reflection from the left at k0 vanishes. The transmission at k0 is 1, so it is unidirectionally invisible from the right, and the left reflection can be obtained, because now I have a contour integral and I can use uh, residual theorem to compute the contour. And what you find is the following formula for the reflection. Now it turns out that it, you get a single pole, which is the center at inside the uh, uh, contour, if alpha is less than, uh, is bigger than minus one over four. So I, with that assumption, uh, I get equals to minus eight pi i n alpha divided by alpha 
It's fun. Ah, there is a reason I have introduced that alpha and that n. The reason is the following. You see, alpha and n come here. Alpha can be anything. You can take it to be positive. Only it shouldn't be less than minus 1 over 4, so that this, this equation holds. But n can be as large as you wish. But because alpha is arbitrary and is arbitrary, I can achieve any value for this. So this is like a potential which is invisible from the right, and its right reflection can be controlled and be tuned. Well, the modulus can be controlled. The, the phase seems to be fixed, but the phase is really not a problem. Why? Because I showed you when you do translation in space, the phase changes. So by moving the support from 0 to L to somewhere here, D and D plus L, the phase changes by a, I mean, R changes by a phase, so you can also uh, tune the phase. So this is the first example of an exactly unidirectionally invisible potential with tunable right reflection, and these such potentials can be used for inverse scattering, local inverse scattering, in the sense that suppose you give me the left, right reflection and transmission amplitudes and ask me, find the potential so that this is its left reflection, this is its right reflection, and this is transmission. Well, you could put at most four potentials of this form next to one another and get potentials with this data. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, so you talk about this uh, Hamiltonian which is non-Hermitian. Uh, so is it possible to choose a, a complex potential to make this Hamiltonian Hermitian? Oh, look. This Hamiltonian, because of this K, it's not even diagonalizable, right? Potential, whatever it is, doesn't change that. So no matter what potential you pick, complex or real, this is always non-hermitian. It's actually pseudo-normal, but not diagonalizable. So the potential doesn't change the feature. I mean, this is this is. The non hermeticity comes from this part, which is not dependent on the potential. Okay. Any more? Um, so I have a question about the last example. So it looks like um, in the exponent, the combination of I, K, X always appear together. Is that true? Me? So the combination, the product of I, K, X always appear yes, together. Yes. So that means in the end, the potential, no matter how you construct it, is always PT symmetric. It is what? PT symmetric. Uh, well, if you choose an S which is polynomial, that's always the case. Yeah, I mean, these are have that symmetry. Well, I wouldn't say PT symmetric because <laughs> okay, <laughs> I'm not rain, so. I have a question. Um, once you manage to simplify equations for transfer matrix to equations for standard quantities for scattering, uh, it came to my mind that there was something like dynamical formulation of, of uh, scattering theory, which goes under the name of Kaloger, I think, where phase shift was a uh, solution of differential equation. Hmm. Is there some connection with this formalism? No, no. That, uh, phase shift is when you have S scattering, right, in three dimension. Uh, so that's like doing a scattering in half line. When you have just one phase shift. Here you have three variables. But definitely this is a different route. I haven't done it for half line, so 
maybe if you do it for half time, you get the same thing. I don't know. Uh, so last lecture, you were talking about a nonlinear potential, delta x. <laughs> Does this method help in that case? Like, can you use some non perturbative methods normally used for studying well, time evolution? So to study. you have a nonlinear wave equation, and you do scattering for nonlinear wave equation. This won't work, definitely, because I'm using the ideas of transfer matrix, and I connect it to the Schrodinger equation, which is linear. So this is a first-order system, which is equivalent to the second-order linear Schrodinger equation. Now, if you want to do it for the nonlinear case, you'll get a nonlinear first order equation and none of this will be valid. It will be a nonlinear generalization of like uh, time ordered explanation, which I don't know what it means. You have developed a formalism when the incident thing is a plane wave. Now uh, let's substitute the plane wave by a wave packet. Yeah. Okay, now of course there is a natural distortion because even in the absence of potential, it's going to decay and I mean, distort and all that. But suppose if a wave packet encounters a PT symmetric uh, potential, non Hermitian though, uh, would some modes be preferentially enhanced and some suppressed or something like that? What is suppressed or enhanced? I mean, suppose if you break the wave packet into some, into the plane waves, okay, right. a Fourier transformation, if you will, just PT symmetric potential. Uh, would it enhance certain things or suppress, you know, because of its natural All property? All I said is valid for arbitrary complex potentials. Okay, so okay. Definitely, it uh, even the symmetric symmetry also. Okay. And you can do wave packet scattering if you do Fourier transform to reduce it to the thing. So you you do can have amplification and decay. Yeah, it'll be selective though. Okay, isn't it? Yeah. Thank you. No more questions? Then let's uh, thank Ali again.